morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And um, we're going to continue working on this study on Daniel chapter 11, going through this, um, uh, I guess this is a, I don't know what you would call this sheet. It's a worksheet. It's um, taking the verses in Daniel chapter 11 and writing the historic and the present truth application. So before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we invite your spirit here as we open your word together. We are thankful for all the things that you do in our lives, uh, for the things that you have uh, been teaching us in these studies. And we just ask that your Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts and minds, that you can comfort each one of us. We know that um, there's a, a lot of information, but we just ask, Lord, that we can see it in its simplicity as it applies to us today, and that we can be encouraged by your presence, by your leading, and your guidance. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again, everyone. So what we did uh, yesterday is we we looked at this document. Now, this is uh, from a book by Swearington called uh, um, The Tidings Out of the Northeast. And his views on Daniel 11 are very similar to ours in regard to uh, the historic application, and especially when you get to Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. Now, it doesn't mark a time into the end there, but he is taking the view of Louis F. Weir that Daniel 11, verse 45b would be fulfilled in the history connected with the fall of the Soviet Union. So we have this premise that um, that we've seen, that we demonstrate, that when we go back and look at all of Daniel chapter 11, the end part of Daniel chapter 11, dealing with the history from Daniel 11, verse 40b to Daniel 11, verse 45. The history is the history that we're in. That's the history of the Sunday law. And it's repeated throughout Daniel chapter 11 by these different kingdoms. And we have in Daniel chapter 11, we have the Persian kingdom. We have the Greek kingdom, the Roman kingdom, and then both in its pagan and, and papal forms. And these uh, are all then repeated at the end of the world. Now, this this insight, this understanding uh, came about as a result of Jeff back in 1989, uh, beginning a study related to the idea that history is going to re be repeated, that the history in connection with this prophecy, the prophecy of Daniel 11, is going to be repeated as well as Millerite history being repeated. So this is what this movement is founded upon. It's founded upon the understanding of a repeat of history. Now, prior to 1989, there were other voices taking some of Ellen White's verses uh, regarding Daniel chapter 11. And, and even though it says the history in connection with this prophecy will be repeated, they interpreted that the prophecy is going to be repeated not the history and connection with the prophecies would be repeated. And they were time setting using the, the symbolic spans of time, you know, 1260 and so forth, and pick, putting them into literal spans of time. Now, this movement in, as time progressed within the movement of taking this repeat of history, we started to see that time elements were involved but not in the way that people like um, Charles Wheeling, for instance, not to be confused with Charles, uh, with um, Robert Wheeland, uh, you know, those names are similar, but Wheeling was his last name, um, who back in the 80s was, was using this sort of literal time. So not in that way. So, so we weren't doing it in the same way that these time setters were. Now, we know that presently, Jeff, um, after the disappointment of July 18, 
you know, he, he began writing um, and publishing on July 29th. That's going to be the Sabbath, the last day of our camp meeting that we had this summer. Uh, Jeff is going to claim that um, the coming of the Comforter came at that time. So he has this this article, uh, July 29th, and of course it's that that Sabbath of our camp meeting, the last Sabbath of our camp meeting, which would be significant. He's not there, of course. He's just publishing this article. But we can see that that time is involved in our movement. So even Jeff, in a sense, acknowledges acknowledges it indirectly. Um, so when we look at this history, when we look at uh, the reason why we've been studying this, why we've been going into this detail, has to do with the prediction. So we had two predictions that this movement made, if you want to look at it in its just simplest form. We made one prediction regarding July 18, 2020, and another one regarding Donald Trump. Now, it's a bit more involved than just simply we may set a date for July 18, 2020, that Nashville would be hit by a nuclear attack by Islam. It wasn't really just that date. There's other dates associated with it. It's all part of the structure, as well as understanding that we did predict uh, Trump's election. And we labeled him the last president of the United States. Now, that was kind of odd in the sense that we had already paralleled the kings of Persia, starting with Cyrus, with the presidents of the United States. But we know that there are seven Persian kings because we get this number seven from the seven thunders. And we would see that there's the last seven kings of Judah, the first seven kings of Persia. But we only went to Trump, right? We, we really went to the fifth king. Now, on at the end of our 777 day period that began November 9th, 2019 and ended December 25th, 2021, God gave this movement some light. And and there was two very specific things and maybe a third other thing. But the two specific things were Colin's presentation about uh, the connection between the presidents of the United States and the kings of Persia in Daniel chapter 11, uh, verse 2 and 3, and then also Revelation 17, so the, the seven kings there. So that connection um, was extremely important. Now, when that was presented, it was really clear that um, we should we should study this as a movement. This wasn't just some idea that Colin came up with. This was actually God giving this movement some light. And God has done that many, many times. But when he first gives us light, is that light complete? Do we understand it fully at the moment it's given? No. No. Our eyes need to adjust to this light so that we can see what its significance is. Now, often what ends up happening is people who receive light. This is always a danger. We've seen it with Chawatu. We've seen it with Emiliano. We've we've seen it all through this movement. There's a great danger. And that danger is the person can think that because they received light, then they're now the messenger. And... The light has to be shared to the movement. The movement has to study the light. It's not just one man who who is now chosen to be uh, God's messenger. It is a movement that God has chosen. And this is why with July 18, 2020, even though I believe July 18, 2020 was light, because the movement didn't accept it, I didn't promote it. I did it first because Jeff originally accepted it. But when it was decided that, you know, we're not going to share these things, then I continued to study, but I wasn't sharing this. I wasn't, you know, trying to push this idea because I understand this principle. I also understand that just because God's given me light, there's no, that doesn't mean that I'm now the source of unit that everybody has to look to me for light. 
And same with Colin or anyone. We are all just part of a movement. The idea that some person is Samuel Snow, we know that that's not the case. That this movement contains these characteristics of Samuel Snow. So, for instance, Samuel Snow has his third um, letter written on June 22nd, 1844. It's a Pentecost letter. Now, Jeff is going to receive $165,000 on June 22nd, 2011. And he's going to recognize this as a symbol. June 22nd becomes a symbol of this movement. I can say it's a symbol of FFA, which is, is partly true. It's, it's a symbol definitely of, of this movement. But it's not just about FFA. It's about the fact that this movement has received God's spirit. And God has given us light for these end days. Um, and we can see then when somebody comes along and thinks that they're Samuel Snow. I mean, the first one I remember doing that specifically was um, back at uh, in 2013, early in 2013. I believe it was. I don't think it was 2012. Uh, but... Uh, um, we had a brother, which I can't think of his name, Leo. Leo Ortiz. What was his last name? Ortiz? I'm not certain. But anyway, he, he had some ideas basically that he was Samuel Snow, that he had all this light. And, um, you know, it was pretty evident that he didn't. He's somebody I really liked. Uh, you know, I thought he was. Uh, noticing things that other people hadn't noticed. But it doesn't matter, right? Just because a person has received light, nobody has to listen to that person. You know, just from sheer authority. What you have to do is you have to study whatever is being shared and decide what is truth and what is error. And that needs to be done together as a movement. And so that's why we've been seeking all through this history uh, to study together to share with one another and to examine things that people present even when we're not really sure uh, about the person we still have to examine what's presented and so we've seen that Odilio and Colin have presented uh, ideas that we've needed to examine and we've examined them and other people have had light that that they've shared with this movement uh, Stephen, of course, had the 777 years from 457 BC to 321. And of course, that becomes significant because December 25th, 2021, in which Stephen recognized this, is a symbol of the Sunday law, and 321 is a symbol of the Sunday law. Right? So, so we have all of this light that we're trying to sort out. Now, yesterday was rather scattered. So one is, is a little bit distracted by some things, um, but that's OK. You know, sometimes we have these scattered studies. But one of the things I was distracted about was some mistakes that I had made. Right. So I don't like making mistakes, but I made some mistakes. But I knew that those mistakes were in God's providence. And so we're going to be looking at those in some other studies. We're going to go through and find because I, we're uncovering some things. The, about symbols and that I think are going to help us in this study. And, and the thing I don't like about it is a little bit esoteric. That is, you kind of have to be in the know to really understand what we're doing. Um, but God is giving us light for our feet to sort through all of this information. So now we're looking at these verses. So we went through these yesterday, but I want to go through them again. Uh, just a little more slowly, a little more thoughtfully. So we know when we look at Daniel 11, verse 1, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, uh, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name is called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. This is referring to Daniel 10, verse 1. So we put it in here because this is marking... Um, the third year of Cyrus. Now, 
If we look at 1989 to 1991, the third year is 1991, right? 1989 is the first year, 1990 is the second, 1990 is the third year. Now, we know that we have uh, this third year of Cyrus. So technically then, when is the first year of Cyrus? It would be 1989, right? That is, it's going to be 538. Now we know Babylon falls on October 13th, 539 BC. That's going to be um, on the 16th day of the seventh month. So it's going to be a couple of weeks into the Jewish civil year that we, we would then say, well, that's going to be 538. Because right? the year is going to begin in the fall, the civil year. And so that year 538 is going to be the spring of that year, right, if you're starting in the fall, um, that Cyrus, uh, or pardon me, so this is, this is when it falls. So it's a year when Darius technically begins his first year as the king of Babylon, right? So even though they conquer Babylon, if you're going to count a king's reign, you would count the first year. So the first year of Darius, the mood tech need would technically begin in the spring. Hopefully this makes sense to people. Now, the thing about Darius is he's already Darius the Mede, right? He's already the king of the Mede Persian Empire. Cyrus, his nephew, is the king of Persia. He's already the king of Persia, right? But this is the Mede Persian Empire. And Darius the Mede, being the uncle, is really in charge of the empire. Cyrus is operating in 539 when he conquers Babylon. He's acting as the general of the Media Persian army. But we're given Darius the Mede in the Bible. And this was always a problem um, for the critics of the scriptures because no such person was recorded in history except that we know that Darius is not necessarily his name, but a type of title or some kind of family name or some kind of throne name, right? So when we look at history and we look at Xenophon, who records this history, he uh, says that this is Cyaxerxes. He's the uncle of Cyrus. He's actually the king of the Medes. Right? So when he gives this history, we can actually look at it and just say, here we have recorded history, and this drives the meat is side series. So, so we we can place him, okay. And this is important because as we've studied the book of Daniel, as we've studied Daniel chapter ten and eleven, we've been able to over time piece together this history much more clearly than people had in the past. That is, we know a lot more about the details of the timing of events. So Darius the Mede is a historical figure. We can record him in history. He just has a different name. He's not referred to as Darius. And Cyrus, his first year of the king of Babylon. So when they conquer Babylon, they become the king of Babylon. They're taking over Babylon. Um, Darius is the one who actually becomes the king of Babylon. Cyrus gets the title king of lands. So, so he has different roles. I mean, he's the king of Persia, but he's going to become the king of lands. And then with the death of Darius the Mede, his uncle, then he becomes the king of Babylon. So it's, it's a little bit confusing because we can talk about his third year here in um, Daniel 10, verse 1. But actually, it's also called his first year. Right? So it's the third year from when he conquers Babylon, but he's not technically the king of Babylon. But he is the king of Persia. And it's not the third year of him being king of Persia. He's been king of Persia for a long time. So this first and third year depends on the perspective. Okay. So hopefully that's clear to people. Now there are some things about this verse that we, we have addressed when we studied it. 
and um, that we need to remind ourselves of. So when it says he had understanding of the thing, he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. What's the thing and what's the vision? Does anybody remember? So the thing is the bar and the vision is the morale. And so the Debar is chapter 7, or pardon me, chapter 9. Chapter 9 is the Debar. That's the 70 weeks. And the vision, the Marah, that's going to be the 2300 years. So here by Daniel chapter 10, when he has this vision, which is in Daniel chapter 11, he has this, this prophecy. He now has an understanding of the 70 weeks, and an understanding of the 2300 days. And because of that, he's now recognizing that some events have to happen. And one is that the decree has to go forth, right? So that God's people can return to Jerusalem, right? So that's why he's going to have this fast, this 21-day fast in chapter 10. And we know that this is going to be uh, this conflict in the mind of Cyrus that's going to lead to the issuing of the decree on April 23rd, 536 BC. So when we get to 11 verse 1, also I, this is the angel Gabriel, in the first year, that is 538, right? So if we think about the third year, right, of Cyrus, it's it's also could be the first year of Darius the Mede, could be considered the first year of Cyrus. And I think that's the context in which this is. So this is from the fall of Babylon. So that's going to be 538. Technically, it's, you know, the Babylon falls in 539. But after Babylon falls, Darius is, he's going to be strengthened in that. So there's there's something about Darius in conquering Babylon that God is leading. Him. And the angel Gabriel and Christ are there in this conflict. So, so I, I, so also I, the angel Gabriel in the first year, but some people think this could be Christ speaking, um, instead of the angel Gabriel, but, um, this is, you know, Pamela and I speaking. Anyway, also I in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and strengthen him. Now I will show thee the truth. Uh, behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. And we know those three kings are Cambyses, False Mertus, and Darius the first, because it's recorded in the book of Ezra. So this suggestion that it might be, you know, it's going to skip False Mertus and go to uh, Xerxes, and then the, the, that the fourth is going to be Artaxerxes. It's not according to the scripture of truth. And remember that this is all according to the scripture of truth, because in Daniel 10, the last verse, just before he explains all of this, I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, that there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. So that's why we say it's the angel Gabriel who's speaking, because he's talking about Christ in uh, the third person, right? So, um, so we get here, we got Gabriel speaking, and he's going to talk about, I will show thee the truth, that is, according to the scripture of truth. So we're going to have to understand that these kings are according to the kings listed in Ezra chapter 4, right? And five, and and 6. So you're going to go through that. So we have Cambyses and False Smyrtus that are mentioned, and then Darius is going to be involved because they're going to stop under False Smyrtus. They're going to stop the building of the temple and then... Uh, Darius is going to issue a decree after a long search, um, finding it in Ecbatana, the record of Cyrus's original decree. And so, so those are going to be all listed in the scripture of truth. There he shall yet stand up yet three kings in Persia. So Daniel's making this prophecy. He's not writing it after it occurred because Daniel doesn't live that long. He's old, old man already when he receives this vision. And the fourth, which is Xerxes, um, shall be far richer than 
they all, and by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. So we know that this happens with Xerxes. He's going to have this war against Greece, and that's going to be Esther chapter 1. Now, when we make the application of this, we say that uh, the first year, that's going to be 1989. The third year is 1991. Darius the Mede parallels Reagan. So uh, Cambyses, Falsmertus, and Darius I are Clinton, Bush II, and Obama, because the one that's there at present is Bush the first, right? So if we go to Cyrus, back to verse 10, we can see Bush the first is the one who is the king. The previous king was Darius the Mede, and the ones that are coming, Clinton, Bush, and Obama, can be seized false murders and Darius the first. The fourth then has to be Xerxes, which is Trump. And this is what this movement had taught prior to Trump's election. There was still doubt about predicting, you know, for some people it was hard to say, well, Trump's going to be president. Now we can see quite clearly that he's the only one that could fit this role because of the events that unfolded. But, um, but that was the prediction that Trump would become president. Now we would say he's the last president of the United States. He's, so however we want to understand that, we, we know that the United States in our line is conquered on January 6th, 2021. And Trump loses to the globalists, right? Against Grisha. So he stirs up all, and by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grisha. That's what happened with Xerxes. And this is what happens with Trump. So the only reason he can become president of the United States because he doesn't really have the support of the Republican uh, establishment, but he does have support of the grassroots. So he has a grassroots movement, first to become uh, the leader of the Republican Party and then to be elected as the president of the United States. But he's going to lose, right? So the globalists, the UN, the Democrats, they defeat him. So now it says a mighty king, Alexander the Great. Now, we know that this was all the kingdom of Persia. So now we're moving to the kingdom of Greece. And it doesn't make sense to continue seeing this as the United States. Right? And this is the, the thing that Colin did that I right away saw couldn't be. And But Colin didn't do it first because... In the original notes that I had when we did this back in 2017, I put Trump there, right? So did Jeff, right? That's why I put Trump there. And I talked with Jeff about it, and I said I didn't agree, but I still put it there in my notes. But Trump can't be Alexander the Great because this is now a new line. This is going to bring us back to the time of the end. And when we saw how that works, we can see that there are keys that tell us that this is not a continuation of the Persian line, but it's going back and repeating history. So Greece is going to repeat our history. So we would put USSR there as a parallel with Alexander the Great. Now, people would say, how can we move from individuals to governments or to philosophies, right? To ideologies, right? The question is, how can we do that? Well, it's quite simple. This is now a new vision. It's not addressing kings, the kings of Persia, which is why we can make that application. It's addressing the kingdom of Greece and its divisions. And the kingdom of Greece represents the globalists, right? We've understood this for a long time. So this, ha if it's, and it's also a new line because it's now, it's not continuing Persia, it's starting with Greece. And so we could connect this with our history. So a mighty king, Alexander the Great, shall stand up, shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. Right. So this is the idea there is he's going to uh, 
according to Swearington, he's going to put conquer a vast territory. That's what it means doing according to his will. But it's not so much conquering a territory as acting out his will in conquering a territory. That is, we're going to have the Soviet-Afghan war. And, and so we connected this chronologically. We need to put these into the notes. So we're going to, with these notes, we're going to put in our diagrams um, and the calculations that we did and so forth. Um, so these dates, these spans of time, when we put look at the Soviet-Afghan war here, um, we know that it's it has a specific span of time. So we can put that in here. And, and we probably should put these other dates more specifically. So when we go back here, we want to look at December 25th, 1991, right? Oops. I only have the 1991 in there. Right? That makes sense, right? We want to, we want to be more precise when it comes to these things. Um, and then this is going to be uh, November 9th, 1989. Now, we could probably even put here, um, you know, Trump is going to become the president of the United States. November 9th. 2016, right? We can put that there, um, right? Does that make sense to do that? So that's, that's going to be his election. Now, we also know we could probably put January 20th, 2017 in there, but I'm just going to put the November 9th. So we can see that no November 9th date shows up uh, in these lines. Okay. Okay, they shall be far richer than they all, or he shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grisha. Now, um, so when mighty King Alexander the Great, so this is the Soviet Union, shall stir up and shall rule with great dominion to do according to his will, to conquer, conquer a vast territory, we're going to know that this war is from December 24th, um, 1979 to February 15th, uh, 1989. Okay, so being a bit more specific here. Oh, this type of thing. Okay. And when he shall stand up at the height of his power, his kingdom shall be broken. So, so maybe what we could put, um, so we, we have here November 9th, 1989. Right? So that's the fall of the Soviet Union, which happens, and his kingdom shall be broken. Here's his death in 323. We can place this here. So this is a period of time, 777 inclusive days. We count to when the, the retirement or the um, resignation of uh, Gorbachev, it's going to be December 26, 1991. So, I mean, there's a progression of things, but we're putting the December 25th as it connects to our history. And, he, and shall be divided towards the four winds of heaven. So the four Hellenistic empires. Now, this is going to occur at 9-11, right? So 9-11, we need to put that it's 2001. We all know that it is. Um, and this is not according to his posterity nor according to his dominion, which he ruled. His former kingdom would not be under one ruler. So, so we know that the UN is divided. So... The Soviet Union is divided, but it's not just the Soviet Union. It has to do with the principle of the globalists. So the globalist agenda moves to the UN. 
and his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides those, the four former generals of Alexander, Ptolemy, Cassander, Lysimachus, and Seleucus. So now it doesn't just happen at, at that time. This, this kingdom shall be plucked up. His kingdom shall be plucked up even for others. So the plucking up of a kingdom, what is the plucking up of a kingdom? When we see it in other histories, it is a conquering of a ter territory, right? Uh, the papacy is going to pluck up three of the horns. So we can see. Now, this word pluck up, um, you know, we, I, I don't know if I've ever even thought about this word. Um, but it just is a word that means to tear away, um, literally, right? Natash, um, that's translated as destroy, forsake, pluck, out, up, by, by the roots, pull up. Um, now the idea of that these are, now here, they're not referred to as horns, but they are in Daniel chapter 8, right? We have these different horns. So you can see the idea of plucking up a horn, this word here, to tear away, pluck up, applies to this. So they're going to conquer these territories. And one of the things that Chalitude brings out is that there are three geographical locations that Seleucid has to conquer. So he's going to conquer the, the area, which becomes the, the, the main area of Syria and Palestine, all that area over there. Um, hollow Syria, it's called Col Syria. And then um, Lysimachus and Cassander's kingdoms, right? So, so we know that these 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 territories, all these different territories, are given, and then they're going to be uh, eventually to the point that we have the king of the south, that's Ptolemy, and he's going to be given that uh, right at the time uh, that the kingdom is uh, divided. But his his kingdom shall be strong, and and one of his princes, now it says of his princes. So the, the suggestion is that this is one of Ptolemy's princes. This is Seleucid who aligns himself with Ptolemy. He doesn't have a territory, but he's then going to conquer uh, along with uh, Ptolemy. And then he's going to be given uh, part of that territory and then conquer Cassander and Lysimachus. So he's going to end up as the king of the north. Um, he shall be strong above Ptolemy and have dominion. His dominion shall be great dominion. So I think the only reason why people just think that one of his princes is referring to one of Ptolemy's princes is just because of how we look at it in English. But I still think it makes more sense to say one of Alexander's princes because he is. So he's going to have this great dominion. So I don't think it essentially changes how we look at this history. The main thing is that he he has three territories that he has to conquer to become the king of the north. So it says, in the end of years, they ju shall join themselves together. So I need to change the screen here because I'm reading from the Bible. You guys are looking at this paper. Right. So we got uh, the king of the south, so that's Ptolemy, shall be strong, and one of his princes, that's Seleucus the first. Now, when we look at these notes here, you can see that when I was originally doing this, France in 538, uh, papacy in 538. But if we're applying it to our time, how would we do this? Because we already have above, we're dealing with the U.S. The U.N. with our history. So we can't be looking at France and the papacy in this line, right? We must be connecting this with our line. Right? I mean, this is a, a correct application. We can see the parallel. So this is what Chawatu is presenting. Is he saying, well, there's these three obstacles that need to be conquered. 
And those are going to be the things that the king of the south is going to conquer, right? In or, or pardon me, that that uh, the king of the north is going to conquer, right? So you have France is the king of the south, and the king of the north is the papacy. But France is France the king of the south in 538? That's a question I have. The first off is. France, the king of the south in 538. Anybody have thoughts on this? France is the king of the south in 1798. And France is the power that puts the papacy on the throne of the earth. But is France the king of the south in 538? Does it have those characteristics in 538? No, it's not. Okay, it's not. Now, I don't know if we can really place the King of the South in 538. Because remember, when we're taking this original history, we're taking uh, the symbols that attach to, to Greece, we're taking this King of the North, King of the South, and they're going to refer uh, spiritually to events after 538 in which now we can see after 538 that um, no longer are we dealing with literal. We're not dealing with Egypt. We're not dealing with Turkey as the king of the south, king of the north. So when we get to 1798, you know, we don't have Egypt as the king of the south. And, and so for, and if we're, if we're dealing with this area of, of France, I don't think that we can actually make this parallel. I don't think that we can say the king of the south is France in 538. Now, we could say the king of the north is the papacy uh, when we get to 1798, because we're, we're now applying things. Babylon is going to apply to the papacy, spiritual Babylon, not literal Babylon. So I don't really see how we can even make this application to say that France is the king of the south and the papacy is the king of the north. Now, also, is France fighting against the papacy in 538? Now, we could say, you know, in earlier histories, we have all of these Germanic tribes taking down Rome. So I don't I don't know how you would apply that. So even even on the surface there's some problems here. But we're not going to make this to be beginning. We're going to say that this is um events that are connected with our history. So the king of the south at the time of the end is the USSR, right? That's who we would put here. So we put the USSR here. Now, if we say, Brother Collins, yeah. can I ask a question? Yeah. Was was the was the king? Was France uh, even a country back then? Yeah, of course. It was. In five thirty eight, it's the one that puts the papacy on the throne of the earth. Right. Right. So, um, Clovis is the king of France. He's the Frankish king. Right. So so France has has a role there in 538, but it's he's not the king of the south. Right. He doesn't he doesn't represent atheism or anything like that. So so that would be one of the problems with that view. But we're applying this here to the Soviet Union. So the king of the south is the Soviet Union. And now here is where we say one of his Alexander's princes, the Soviet Union's princes. Well, there is an alliance um, that happens between the papacy and uh, the United States. So if we're going to say the king of the south here is the Soviet Union, um, the one of his princes being uh, either Alexander's princes or Ptolemy's princes, 
how would we relate that to uh, the king of the north, right? So this is where we would have a problem with our interpretation as we're trying to look at this. So we have to say, well, one of his princes, that is, and he, Seleucus. Now, Seleucus, in this case, if the USSR is the king of the north or the king of the south, the king of the north is the papacy. But this is a papal U.S. a coalition. So, so if we're saying that the that this Alexander represents, you know, the Soviet Union, it, it doesn't. I, I don't know how we would. Um, so maybe what we would uh, do here. Um, is is we have to look at who Alexander represents. So what did we say Alexander represented? The USSR, right? So that's how we did that. Okay. Oops, I don't want Alexander to be read. Get this back to the black text. So I'm saying, what I'm doing, let's do it this way. Yeah, I do want that bold though. And there we go. So how would how would we take either one of Alexander's would be in the USSR or the King of the South? So is the King of the South the USSR or is it the UN or how would we look at this in this verse if we're going to make this parallel? So the King of the South. That's Ptolemy the first. We're saying the king of the south is the Soviet Union, right? And one of the kings of the south's princes. But see, this is going to, how is, if we're going to say that this is the papacy USA, is there a connection here between, between these to say that he's one of the princes or one of the generals? Because the Soviet Union is going to fall. So, so the king of the north, you know, is definitely not connected to the USSR. I mean, we have these three powers, the Soviet Union, the United States, and the papacy. So how do we align these verses? So this is going to be a problem that we have to think through. And he shall be strong above him. So it is... The king of the north, the USA, the papacy, is going to be strong above Ptolemy. Now, in this application here, would we have to say that, because um, this is after the fall, could we change this to the UN? Slash globalists. So this is after the fall of the Soviet Union. If it's after the fall of the Soviet Union, then the King of the South is not the USSR, but the UN. The globalists shall be strong. One of Alexander's USSR princes. The question is, how do we connect Seleucus, the papacy, the USSA, to Alexander's princes? Even if, so could, if we did this, that this is uh, instead of Alexander, right? Instead of interpreting this way, we would have to interpret it as one of Ptolemy's princes, right? The one of the kings of the South's princes. So how would we connect that? Right. You, you see the problem. We, we have a problem whether we make this 
Ptolemy's, one of Ptolemy's princes, or one of the UN's or the globalists. Or, pardon me. Ptolemy's are one of Alexander's. So we have the UN or the globalists. Now, is the United States one of the princes of the UN? Well, in the sense that it's part of the UN. Yeah. Now, now we have, of course, the United States. We also have the papacy. Now, the, is the papacy part of the UN? It's working behind the scenes and advising the UN. Okay. Well, um, so the thing about um, the Vatican, so they're okay. uh, what call a permanent observer state at the United Nations. So I, I guess so it's not it's not a UN member, right? It's observer. Because uh, so, it doesn't satisfy the modern definition of a nation, which has permanent population and defined territory, the government and capacity to enter into relations with other states. Um, now it does of course have diplomats that go to the papacy, right? It um, you know, so it's kind of a state, but it doesn't have all of the characteristics of of a nation that that we would normally have. Okay, somebody else had a comment. Yeah, I was just going to say, wouldn't wouldn't she be riding the um, UN? Wouldn't she be controlling it? Yes, but. Um, Okay, so you're you're confusing things here. So you're trying to bring in Revelation 17. Uh, it is it has its seat. The seven heads are the seven hills or the seven mountains upon which the woman sitting. Right. So when we look at the papacy, its its military is the United States. So I would think the best way to address this is um, for me to change my mind, if that's allowed. Um, so if I put here that we would take uh, the UN, the globalist, one of the princes would be the U USA. Um, so what am I doing here? So um, pardon me, I got to do this as UN. And then this is going to be the USA. There we go. So one of the members of this United Nations globalist thing is the USA. And so if I change my mind about which one of it is, because for it to be Alexander's, that would be Alexander's going to be the USSR. And definitely it's not one of the USSR princes that becomes the king of the North. It's the United States that becomes the king of the North. Now, the king of the North is connected to the papacy, right? Because they have this coalition. So, um, but I'm going to do it this, this way. Just going to get rid of the papacy out of there. Just put the USA. Because um, it, it is a coalition of these powers. Shall be strong above him, Ptolemy the first. So I guess, you know, if you know Ptolemy the first, that's going to be the UN. Okay. Now, to understand this in its, uh, I guess I need to put equals there. and have dominion, gain the territory of Syria. So Syria, what is this territory symbolizing? Now this is what we call actually hollow Syria, coal Syria, hola Syria. So what's the territory of Syria? Does it symbolize something? So we're not going to take it literally. Any thoughts on that? 
Well, I don't want to confuse things, but is, is that the, uh, in the northern part? Well, Syria is, is Aramaic, right? Aram is the word Syria is, is Aram, right? That's the area just to the, um, north and, uh, east of Israel, right? So Syria is right beside Israel up in the northern part of Israel. But we're looking at it symbolically. So, so to say he gains the territory of Syria, I would say that this would be referring to the land of the United States in some way. But it's, but it's also, um, so it has to do something with, with the United States. So I'm not sure exactly how to, to understand this. I mean, we're not going to take it literally that says, you know, he op- occupies that territory. So I, I'm not sure. Okay. So. So we, we would have to think about this a little bit more and use line upon line to understand this. But we haven't addressed this really before in this direct way. Now, at the end of years, after the first and second Syrian wars, um, they, Ptolemy II, Philadelphus, and Tychus I, Soter. So, um, you know, we're, we're not going to take these kings, at least we haven't thought about taking these kings, and relating them to presidents of the United States as we did with the kings of Persia, right? So, but that might be an idea. There might be some way in which we, we address this, you know, because maybe the, one of his princes could refer to a president of the United States, not necessarily the United States itself. But I hadn't thought about it until just now because we do have these different kings of of the Telemic Empire and also kings of presidents of the United States. So I'm not sure how to address this at this point, you know, how much work we want to do, you know, right here while we're working on this um, this presentation. Now, um, when we look at these uh, Seleucid kings, you're going to have, you know, one is they're not going to line up with the presidents of the United States. There isn't like, we could say, well, maybe the first seven Seleucid kings, you know, so you'd have Seleucus and Tychus the first, right? Seleucus the first and Tychus the first. And Tychus the second, Seleucus the second, then Seleucus, Seleucus the third, and Tychus the third, and then uh, Seleucus the fourth. So that's going to give you seven. And you could have the eighth would be Antiochus Epiphanes, and right, if you wanted to look at an eighth, um, and maybe there's some virtue in there. So maybe that brings you up to that history of Antiochus Epiphanes. It becomes a counterfeit. It becomes a parallel, I guess, is maybe a better word, for what the papacy does in the Sunday law at the time of the end, right? So maybe maybe there's some virtue in that, dealing with this Greek empire. But I don't know what you do with the Ptolemic uh, kings. You're going to have seven of them, right? Up to that sort of, um, yeah, so it's going to go up in, into that same history. You're going to have Ptolemy the first to Ptolemy the seventh. So maybe there's something in there that we would have to connect, right? So, so I think this is something we have to explore. We need to explore this. We haven't done this. Now, when when we do this, um, we're first going to have this uh, um, this interaction in this history, and so we're going to have this this league, and this league is going to be 2001, right? This is when you're going to have this league between. And uh, let me see here. So I'm just trying to think ahead. So you're going to have Ptolemy II, Philadelphus, and Antiochus I, Soter, 
So that's going to be in that history uh, from 285. Well, it's going to be in 252 BC, right? So that they're going to have this league. That's where Berenice is, uh, who's the daughter of the king of the south. Uh, she'll come to the king of the north. So we're saying that this, this agreement, this league, this alliance is going to occur at 911. Now that's going to be in 252 BC. So we're putting 911 there. That's 252 BC. Now who's, who's the, the king at 911? Of the United States. Bush the first. Bush the second. Yeah, Bush the second. So, so maybe there's some way in which we do this. Um, so Bush the second, it's going to be Antiochus the first. Um, and Antiochus the first is, if we're going to have um, Bush the first and then uh, Clinton and then Bush the second, that would actually be the third of these. So. It wouldn't really fit together, right? Wouldn't because Bush the second is is the third king, and Antiochus the first Soter is the second king, right? So, so maybe that just doesn't fit, right? Um, so that that would be where we'd have problems trying to fit these kings together. But I think we can take this conclusion of the peace in 252 um, when they conclude peace or agree upon peace, this agreement, as 9-11. So those are events connected with 9-11. Now, we're saying that the king's daughter, Berenice, the daughter of Ptolemy II. So this is the daughter of the second king. And I don't know how you would line up these Ptolemic kings with the UN in any way. So... So again, I, I don't know if we can take it that literally, that we're going to have each of these kings represent presidents. Um, you know, unless we change some of our interpretations. So hopefully that's making sense, what, what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to look at something, examine something we never thought of before. Maybe it could work in some way, but on the on the face, it doesn't appear to work. Now, why would we have this? Um, I mean, is it interesting that we have the 252 BC connected to 911? Because you already put this um, prior to knowing about 252 BC as a date. At least I didn't. We put 911 as where this agreement occurs. Right. So this is going to be in this history. They conclude peace and they're going to join themselves together. So this is their league. Berenice, the daughter of Ptolemy II of the south, shall come to the king of the north, Antiochus II, Theos, uh, to make an agreement, uh, peace through a marriage alliance. But she, Berenice, shall not retain the power of her, of the arm. Right. So, so we've gone through this already. Um, we're going to say that this, uh, that, that she's going to be assassinated. So, you know, or going to be executed, however it is. So she's going to be executed by Laodice. So Laodice represents something as well. So we know Berenice represents this philosophy. We'll just call it wokeism. So, um, so if we're going to put this here in this line, uh, I don't know, wokeism, I think that's how you spell it. Right. Just for lack of a better word. I mean, there's probably lots of words that we could put in there, but this is wokeism. This is a philosophy. It's part of um, <clears throat> postmodern thought. And it's atheistic in nature. It's opposed to God. And so we have the daughter of the South, Egypt. Well, Egypt represents the UN, right? That's just the king of the South. I don't know how they got to put equals in here. Okay. 
Is this making sense to people, what we're doing here? Um, I, I need some kind of affirmation just to know that people are at least following what's happening here. This is making sense? Yes, it is. Okay. So now we know that um, they have this alliance, so this marriage alliance, and um, so we know she shall, shall not retain the power of arm, lose her position from the former queen, Laodice, right? So, so Laodice is going to come in and um, so Laodice, which is going to equal what? So we said something like the Protestants, Christianity, Protestant Christianity. Yeah, nice. no, that's pretty badly spelled. Okay. So I don't know if that's the best word to use. No, so this would still be future. So we know at some point that there is this, this ideological battle going on. Now, this ideological battle is going on between the king of the north and the king of the south. But it's in this territory that is symbolized by Syria, which we haven't really defined yet. This is the territory that the king of the north occupies, Syria. So we could say the United States, but you know, we have the USA representing the, the country of the United States. The territory it off, occupies is uh, the United States. Now, we know that it also inhabits the pleasant land, so it must be something more than that. But for now, we're just going to have to leave that, set that aside. Okay, so neither shall he, Antiochus II, so he's the king of the north, stand assassinated by Laodicea. So we have Antiochus II. So Antiochus II is the one who's there at 9-11. So obviously it can't be the kings. And if he's assassinated, let me see, am I doing this right? Um, so if we're going to say that Atticus II, who's the king of the north, is assassinated by Laodicea, uh, he's not going to stand, nor his arm, Berenice's son, so we'd have to figure out that, that one. But she, Berenice, shall be, be executed by Laodicea. Laodice, pardon me, and they that brought her execution of her attendants also. We'd have to define what that is, and he that begat her. Okay, so Angela says uh, the UN has hundreds of military bases across the across the globe, uh, great dominion. Yes, so so I think there's there's something here that we we haven't we need to understand what these symbols are if we're going to give them their direct application, um, we need to define them better. So Berenice is this wokeism. But we see also Antiochus II, who is the king of the north, he's, he's made this league with the king of the south. But it says he's assassinated by Laodicea or Laodice. So, I mean, would we apply that to the history of what happened on January 6, 2021, and how would we do that, right? So you can see the problems that we're facing as we try to sort through this. So we've gone through it, we have this idea about it, but when we try to, to nail down the details, um, we can see that there are parts of this that we don't fully understand. Um, um, so they... Um, Let me see here. And he that strengthened her in these times, I kind of kiss the sec. Um, so yeah, I'm, you know, we're going to have to go through this. Now, right now, we got, um, we got about 20 minutes. 
So we need to look at this in 20 minutes and try to sort through this. I know my mind's getting tired. Okay, so Antiochus II Theos, he's the king of Syria. So we haven't really, we haven't really defined what that territory is, what that means that he's king of Syria. So let, let's look this up here in the Bible. Let's do some line upon line comparison. So when we look up uh, the word Syria, I'm just going to show you here. Yes. And you look it up, it's 758, and it's the word Aram. Now, Aram is where we get Aramaic, right? So Syria is not the biblical name for that territory. It's the area of Aram, uh, of, of Aram, not Aram, Aram. So that, that's the area that we're talking about. Now, this is going to be mentioned first just as a name, right? So Genesis 10, verse 22 to 23. And these are going to be um, the children of Shem, Elam, Asher, Arphax, Avod, and Ram. So you can see these, the Aramaics are Semitic peoples. So they're relatives of the Jews, right? Because um, they're the children of, of Shem. Elamites, Asher, Arphaxat, Wood, and Aram. And then the children of Aram are Uz, Hal, Gether, and Mash. Right? So they're going to have their descendants. Um, so they're going to be that, they're going to occupy that territory. Um, so they're going to be mentioned in, I'm not sure where they put 20, okay, 22, 21. Just going to mention Aram again as a person. It's going to be mentioned in Numbers. He took up this parable and said, Balak, the king of Moab, have brought me from Aram out of the mountains of the east. So they could have translated that Syria. Okay. So we're going to see that, you know, this is referring to Balak, king of Moab, brought me from Aram. So that means Balaam is from Aram. That's where he's from, Syria. Okay, now in Judges, we have it mentioned. So as far as uh, the word Syria, not the word translated as Aram, it's good, first going to be translated to Syria in Judges 10.6. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam and Ashtoreth and the gods of Syria, or the gods of Aram, and the gods of the Zid Zidon and the gods of Moab. So if we're going to deal with a ram as a symbol, right? Syria as a symbol. Would it be more a reference to a false religion rather than a country or a place in our application? Would that make more sense for people? So we're going to say, um, Syria here, so strong above him, Ptolemy the first, the UN, and have dominion, gain territory over. Now we had Laodicea representing a Protestant Christianity. So I'm not sure, you know, the best way to look at this. But if we're going to talk about the territory of Syria, we could just say the churches or the apostate churches, maybe. Maybe that's a better way of looking at it. So if this were the case, if it's apostate churches, can we say that the UN gains dominion over apostate churches? Is, is this a sensible way of translating Syria? Well, and I see the pride flag flying outside of churches, and I see this wokeism in, in the churches and in the schools, the SOGI 1, 2, 3. Yeah, the UN really has strong inroads into education and the church. Okay, so 
So we look at the UN in its control. So the UN, we always think of its military aspects. But the UN has all kinds of philosophical aspects to it, right? It, it, it has um, guidelines on health and education and so forth, right? So um, I'm just going to look up here on here, the role of the UN. So the role of the UN, our work, here's what the United Nations say about themselves. Maintain internal international peace and security, protect human rights, deliver humanitarian a- and aid, support sustainable development and climate action, uphold international law. Right. So those are what they say. Those are their five things. Um, so upholding international laws, settling disputes between states, addressing war crimes. Um, right. So that's going to be all involved in international law. Support sustainable development and climate action. So, I mean, I don't think this would have been one of their uh, original statements. Um, so they launched its sustainable development agenda in 2015. So it's obviously, you know, pretty nutty stuff. Uh, deliver humanitarian aid. Well, we know that they've been doing that for a long time. Um, it's part of their char- charter. So solving international problems of economic, social, cultural, and humanitarian character. Right, so disaster relief and stuff like that. Um, uh, now, the protection of human rights. Uh, was mentioned seven times in the UN's founding charter, making the pro- promotion and protection of human rights a key purpose and guiding principle of the organization. In 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights laid down the principles that brought human rights into the realm of international law. Um, so this document here, um, I'm just seeing what it says. I'm reading it very quickly. It's lots of different articles. So they have all together, I'm not going to be 30 articles. Um, so it says here in their preamble, uh, proclaims the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the General Assembly, proclaims the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a common standard of achievement for all peoples and all nations to the end that every individual and every organ of society keeping this declaration constantly in mind shall strive by teaching and education to promote respect for these rights and freedoms and by progressive measures, national and international, to secure their universal and effective recognition and observance, both among the peoples of member states themselves and among the peoples of territories under their um, a jurisdiction, right? Now, Article 26 is the one that we really want to look at. Everyone has a right to education. Education shall be free, at least in the elementary and fundamental stages. Elementary education shall be compulsory. Technical and professional education shall be made generally available and higher education shall be equally accessible to all on the basis of merit. Education shall be directed to the full development of the human personality and to the strengthening and respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. It shall promote understanding, tolerance, except to those that you consider intolerant, and friendship among all nations, racial or religious groups and shall further the activities of the United Nations for the maintenance of peace. Parents have a prior right to choose the kind of education that shall be given to their children. Um, I'm not sure what they mean by have a prior right. That's kind of an odd way of saying that, but so it's some right prior to their their view. Um, 
but the idea that education shall be compulsory. I, I mean, I find that, I mean, how do you decide what education is? You know, because my older kids were all homeschooled, basically unschooled. So um, they didn't really do school. <clears throat> and of course, they're the ones that are the most successful. Um, diminishes as you go down in age because of uh, education, I mean, quotation mark. So, um, so can we see this then um, when we're dealing with the UN, we're dealing with Syria or Iran, that um, the UN uh, is going to, let me see, how are we doing this here? So I'm going to go back, look at this, sorry. Okay. So the one that gains the territory and is strong above the UN and has dominion is um, is Seleucus, right? Seleucus is the USA. He shall be strong above him, Ptolemy the UN, and have dominion, gain the territories of Syria. So we have to say, what are the territories of Syria? Because we know that um, there's going to be this leak. So it's hard to keep all this in our hands. But so if we're saying that this territory of Syria is the apostate churches, we know that um, after the first and second Syrian wars, they call them, will join themselves together to conclude peace for the king's daughter. So there's this battle going on. So I don't know, I don't know how to frame this. I'm going to have to think about this quite a bit more. Um, any, any thoughts on this? I know we got some of our regular people here, like Stephen and Dwight aren't here and they usually have some comments. Angela, of course, has good comments. Um, so the king of the south, Ptolemy the first Soter. So that's the UN, the globalist, shall be strong. But one of his princes, one of the princes of Ptolemy, the first Soviet, so the prince, princes of the UN, that is Seleucus the first Nicator, USA, he shall be strong above Ptolemy and have dominion, gain the territory of Syria. So we're saying that this is the king of the north. So he's gaining this territory of the apostate churches. Now we look at the UN. The UN has this interest as well, right? So this battle is over something, right? This is this territory of Syria that is Aram that is going to be taken by the king of the north. Now we're saying the king of the north here is the US. We know the king of the north is the papacy as well later on. But in this context here, the king of the north is the United States. It's the army of the papacy. We don't have the papacy here in a direct way. It's it's more something else, right? So so we got we have to try to get this straight in our hands. His dominion shall be a great dominion. So the largest territory of the Hellenistic Empire. So whatever Syria is, whether it's the apostate churches, whether it's something else, we put apostate churches there for now. So the king of the north occupies. Now, what is it that the United States uh, occupies? If we think about the United States, maybe maybe there's something else. I mean, maybe instead of apostate churches, is this something else? Because, because this is a territory. So maybe apostate churches is not a good one here. Um, what about uh, the economic control of the world in this context? Would that fit? I 
we would just say the economy, the global economy. Maybe. I don't know. Does that make sense to people? This is just a suggestion. We're just trying to work through this. So his dominion shall be a great dominion, largest territory of the Hellenistic empires. And in the end of years, after the first and second Syrian war. So we have to figure out what those represent. They, that is both these kings that are there at the time, Ptolemy II Philadelphus and Antiochus I Soter, shall join themselves together, conclude peace in 252 BC. Now we're saying that that's 9-11. So, and, and this is done for the king's daughter, Berenice, daughter of Ptolemy II, wokeism of the south, Egypt, which is the UN, shall come to the king of the north, Tychus the Theos Syria. So the king of the north here is going to be uh, the USA. To make an agreement, peace through a marriage alliance, but she, Berenice, so Berenice, this wokeism, So wokeism, and that's spelled wrong, shall not retain the power of, of, of the arm. So oh, that's bad. So lose her former position from the former queen Laodice. So this is Protestant Christianity. So, so this one here definitely can be apostate Christianity, maybe is one way of looking at it. We'll just put it as Protestant. Neither shall he, the US, stand, stand, be assassinated by Laodicea. So if this is the US, this is, which we're going to just say it's the USA. So it's going to be defeated by this Protestant Christianity. So it's going to be assassinated by Laodicea. Well, what am I doing? Why am I typing that in? <laughs> so, so Protestant Christianity is going to so maybe what if we we did this in some other way? What if we did this as republicanism? So let's just do it this way. We're going to take Protestant Christianity and repeat republicanism. See, I'm a very dyslexic type of. Okay. <clears throat> Can Laodice be republicanism? Again, this is just, we're just trying to do this as a worksheet. So then who is Berenice's son? So we have Berenice, she is um, wokeism, right? Who's Berenice's son? So there's something that comes from wokeism. That is the, the son of Berenice. I don't know. I, I, I shouldn't put Biden in here. But uh, maybe Democrats. Okay. So we're going to come back to this tomorrow. So... Let's close with prayer. A dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the time that we had to study here this morning, and we just ask for your spirit to be with us throughout this day. We pray this, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.